Thunderwolf-Aura! What's up everyone and welcome to Sunday Fallout 131! What a glorious day! Holy <laughs> Holy We have so much stuff to talk about today on this Sunday. I'm trying... <laughs> Other than, you know, checking out some awesome news, I'm also checking out the world's greatest cable and also Ola's Tech Tips is back. For the people that are in the chat premiere right now, you guys rule. Let's head into the news. If you haven't noticed, NAM is happening this coming week. I'm gonna be at NAM. I'll see you there, if you're there. But if you didn't pay attention, you might have seen that the news had been filled with guitar-related news, basically. And we're starting with Slipknot's Mick Thompson going from Jackson to ESP. And not only that, he's also leaving Seymour Duncan for Fishman. That's a pretty big switch right there, holy sh**. Thompson's wife and Guitar Tech both published telling posts on social media and after Slipknot Maestro was spotted playing ESPs live during the band's recent shows in Japan. <laughs> I mean, that's not fake right there. He's pointing at the logo. And look at this. These are the guitars right there. Footage taken from Slipknot's latest live shows in Japan. Thompson can be seen exclusively wielding ESP models, including the Super Strat esque Horizon, the single cut Eclipse, and a V style Arrow. So not only is he switching from Jackson to ESP, he's also letting go of Seymour Duncan, which is a little bit shocking, in my opinion, because uh, obviously he's had his own signature set with them for a long, long time the empty blackouts. And now he's doing Fishman? That's a big leap right there. Here's his wife holding a guitar. Look at that. That's the biggest smile I've seen in my life right there. She's happy that he switched to ESP. Oh, that's right. Because he was with Jackson and Jim Root being with Fender, that means that Fender can't have both names in their roster or their artist roster. That's... Uh, that's... Uh, that's... The news. Okay, he has an Horizon right there, Horizon there. This is an Eclipse. That's an ESP M2 right there. And this is an E2. Hashtag the best. Aww. Very cool. Congrats to Mick Thompson for this. A new era is coming. Last time with Ola, I talked about Kirk Hammett and his greeny Les Paul. Well, now they also announced a Kirk Hammett 1979 Flying V. And boy, oh boy, I think that Gibson might be slightly insane. <laughs> They're gonna make 200 of these for 15 grand. What? 200 people buying this thing? For 15 grand? Oh, you get. Oh, will we get the duct tape shipped with the guitar? Pre duct taped. I mean, that, that is pretty cool, but 15 grand? 200 pieces? Old England math genius right here. That's a total of $3 million right there. If they sell out, that's incredible. Happy for Gibson then, holy shit! You know, it would be easy to say that Gibson are crazy, but I have no idea. They might as well just sell out on these. I, it's just such a crazy world out there right now. So there you go, now you can buy either a greenless pole for 20 grand or a flying V for 15 grand. Holy shit, man. Even more guitar news. Anthrax Scott Ian honors Dimebag Dow with new Baldini Burst Sandra Jackson X Series King V guitar. So obviously, Baldini, uh, Dimebag called Scott Baldini. And uh, that's where it comes from. The Baldini Burst Jackson X Series Scott Ian King V is available now for $8.99. So 
a reasonable price. Hello, what the hell? It's a Floyd Rose special, okay. But uh, that, that's what I've always wanted as a guitar player, is that people to feel like, hey, you know, I, I feel like I could do what, what he's doing. You know, he doesn't seem that much different than me. And, uh, you know, I hope that comes across. Oh, that's nice. Just seeing it like this on the screen, I think it looks sick. It's a nice homage to the Dime Slime. And also for a reasonable price, obviously. It, it's definitely not Gibson prices, let me tell you that. <laughs> so speaking about Dimebag, I haven't heard too much about the, you know, the court case between uh, Dimebag's estate and uh, Dean Guitars or Armadillo Distribution. Uh, I haven't heard about that in a while. In short, the Dimebag estate left Dean Guitars a couple years back and now uh, the Dimebag estate is suing Dean Guitars on a couple of several accounts. But most importantly, it's about who owns the Dimebag shapes and what they can do with them in the future. It turns out that Dean Guitars trademarked Dimebag's Razorback and Stealth back in 2007. But it seems that they did it wrongfully. So I've actually had the court case documents for a, quite a while. I got them sent to me from a contact. And these are public documents, by the way. You can get a hold of these yourself if you have a Pacer account or a lawyer friend or something like that. You can download these documents online and then you can read into it yourself. Look at this, I made some notes about this court case right here. All these little yellow notes right here are my observations in this case. So I figured I would bring up a couple of the points that I see fit and interesting for today's Wola. I have read the court case through before, but I just sat down again and kind of like went a little bit more with a magnifying glass, looking into what has happened and looking into the details. And there's a lot of really interesting information in regards of Dimebag's guitar shapes throughout the years and the brand that he's been working with. Other than the uh, trademark problems, uh, the the lawsuit also contains other points of Dean Guitar's continued use of uh, Dimebag's name uh, after termination of Dimebag's contract and other things. But I think the most interesting part about this court case is the part about the trademarks of the guitar shapes. It's important because whoever owns the Dimebag guitar shapes can continue to produce guitars in his name and continue on with his legacy. The document states that Dimebag designed the Stealth and Razorback guitar. So for instance, Washburn uh, got a license to produce the Stealth uh, when Dimebag was under contract with them. And in their agreement, it states that Washburn wouldn't file any patents, trademarks or copyrights or intellectual property rights on the Stealth and headstock shape. Because obviously, you know, the Stealth was Dimebag sold property. When Dimebag went from Washburn to Dean Guitars in 2004, he licensed his rights and trademark to Dean Guitars so they can produce his guitars. And Dean Guitars went into the endorsement agreements with the quote, the company shall acquire no rights in the trade names or design stealth guitar or Razorback guitar by virtue of this agreement and upon termination of this agreement shall cease the production of Stealth and Razorback style guitars. Okay, so very clear. Uh, Dimebag has a contract where Dean Guitars uh, can produce his guitar under a license agreement. But, uh, you know, Dimebag still being the owner of the shapes. Very standard, I would say. I had a similar contract with Washburn, for instance, with the, uh, with the, the Solar Type A that I brought into Washburn. This is very common when you have an artist who has his own design go into an agreement with a brand and let them build his design. Okay, so it's very standard. I've also been a part of this. Then, as we all know, uh, Dimebag passed away tragically in 2004, and then Dean continued to produce his guitars under the agreement. And that continued all the way up to 2019, where the Dime Estate decided to part ways with Dean Guitars. And at the end of the agreement, Dean Guitars has to stop making the Dimebag guitars. Simple as that. However, this is where it gets juicy. Let's uh, dig into it. <laughs> Despite defendants Dean Guitars expressly acknowledging that it had no rights in the Razorback guitar design, a little over two years after Abbott's death on January 9, 2007, defendants Dean Guitars affiliate company, defendant Concordia, presumably acting as an agent for Dean Guitars, filed a trademark registration for the Razorback guitar design in its name, which matured into US trademark registration, blah, 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 for the mark covering the Razorback guitar design in connection uh, guitars. So Dean trademarked the designs, even though they already signed an agreement that they can't do this. You know, that should be, that should be it right there. They did it behind the back of the Dimebag estate and also claiming that they designed you know, the Razorback, which is not true. Dimebag designed that Razorback. Defendant Concordia committed fraud on the United States patent and trademark <laughs> office uh, <laughs> in the registration of the US trademark registration number, had no rights in the trade dress for the Razorback guitar design, and in fact had expressly disclaimed any ownership, rights, 
in the Razorback guitar design and its ability to use the Razorback guitar design beyond the termination of the endorsement agreement. And just to make this incredibly clear, I did reach out to Rita Haney, Dimebag's girlfriend, uh, to comment on this and just to confirm the contracts that uh, are in the exhibits here, because I can't see the exhibits themselves. I can just see the text. And she responds, yes, it's from a paragraph in the contract. Uh, I am the author of the NDA and it states that they will not retain any copies, extracts or other repertoire productions or reproduce any of the design ideas for their own which is why it was also carved out in the contract in paragraph 17 where the quote is taken from there is a signed agreement that Dean Guitars shall never be able to claim or to have any rights to the trade names or the signs it was always Dimebag's shapes you know and Dean Guitars trademarked them you know that that's a fraud right there in my opinion that should be the nail in the coffin for you know, Dean Guitars right there. Why hasn't anything happened since this? This is in uh, October of 2022. I'm not exactly sure how court cases work in the US uh, in terms of, you know, times and uh, how long things take. But it seems to me like they're just trying to stall all of this and it'll probably just cost more, you know, attorney money or something like that. I, I, I don't know, it just feels like they're stalling on this. So that's my little digging right there. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section. You know, personally, I would just love to see Dime Guitars up and running already. And you know, we, we want to see a continuation of the legacy of Dime Bag. I think Dean Guitars should just let this one go right now before, you know, they're tarnishing their own name even more. It's already pretty tarnished, man. Just saying. The news. Breaking news. The British amplifier brand Marshall it's now a Swedish amplifier brand. <laughs> Holy shit. Marshall Amp sold to Swedish speaker company, bringing an end to family ownership. The iconic UK amp brand used by everyone from Jim Hendrix to ACDC is changing hands. It's being acquired by Swedish firm Sound Industries, the company that currently produces Marshall headphones and speakers and license from the amp brand. All right, according to the CEO, Jeremy de Molliard, the two firms will now sit under a new privately owned umbrella company, the Marshall Group with the Marshall family still owning 24% stake. So the Marshall family is still in the company. They still have voting rights and stuff like that. So, you know, they didn't completely sell it off. And Terry Marshall, uh, Jim Marshall's son, is stating, since my father and I created the original Marshall amp back in 1962, we have always looked for ways to deliver the pioneering Marshall sound to music lovers of all backgrounds and music tastes across the world, says Marshall. I'm confident that the Marshall group will elevate this mission and spur the love for the Marshall brand. So a lot of people are speculating that, you know, Marshall will become more and more of a lifestyle brand now. You know, you have the fridges, you have the, the Bluetooth speakers that have been incredibly successful. And uh, obviously then you have the plugins of, uh, you know, soft tube and and all of that and maybe Marshall will go more into this era nowadays I mean we haven't seen a new Marshall amplifier in a good while right we just have to wait and see what will happen I guess that's that's it I mean the Swedes can do a good job I promise you I'm a Swede I can vouch for the Swedes you know Yngwie Malmsteen is a Swede so many guitar related news but now we're gonna go back to music okay and I wanted to report on this a band called Death Collector with the original Bolt Thrower drummer together with a bunch of other people have released a single uh, Death Collector is the name and as a fan of 90s death metal I can fully support this band right here it's it's beautiful I love this holy shit completely up my alley. Death Collector will release Death's Toll on June 23 and is now streaming the predictably crushing new A Taste of i -Core. I really like it, man. It has its small little taste of bolt thrower in there. You know, shit like this makes me happy nowadays, man. You know, listening to things that sound old. Oh. Disgusting, man. Holy shit. Death Collector, album out June 23. The news, thank you. All right, Adventures with Ola. A privilege that I have now after many, many moons and years of demoing stuff on uh, YouTube and, you know, having my YouTube channel is that I get uh, a lot of stuff sent to me. Back in the early days of my YouTube channel, when I started out, I felt sincerely blessed anytime a brand would even consider sending me anything to demo or, you know, to even acknowledge me as a person they would just 
sent some shit to. And since my YouTube channel has become uh, a little bit bigger now, you know, a lot of brands have started shipping me tons and tons of stuff, it, like guitar related stuff, even non guitar related stuff, even though I'm not asking for it, you know? <laughs> the problem I have right now is that there's just way too many stuff being sent to me. So, it, you know, it's kind of piling up a little bit. And you might say like, oh, that doesn't sound like a problem, you f douchebagola. That sounds like a privilege. And absolutely, I understand this, but it also becomes sort of like a problem. Okay? Where stuff has been sent to me a long time ago, but I haven't been able to touch it because, you know, the, the lack of time, basically. I have so many other things to do. So my immediate thought was, okay, how do I fix this? How do I get more time? Well, that's a problem. I can't get more time. How do I fix this problem? So I figured, let me start a segment in Sunday with Ola where I quickly just unbox and test something that has been sent to me. So right now I have this, for instance, which is supposedly the best guitar cable in the world, according to this guy. So maybe in real life, I wouldn't make a dedicated video to the best guitar cable in the world. Some YouTubers probably would, but I feel like, okay, let me just pull it into the Sunday with Ola segment instead. And you, you get a test, I get to unbox it and you know, Let's make this a segment for upcoming Swolas, right? Just unboxing gear and stuff that I haven't unboxed. I think it's a great idea. But first, I'm gonna check out my new mouse pad that I got. So I purchased a new mouse mat for my gaming PC. Have you seen my gaming PC? And a gaming PC needs a nerdy anime mouse pad. But this time, I stayed away from the big boobs or the big butts <laughs> mouse pads. I got myself an Evangelion one. Ooh! Okay, dude, that looks sick. Take a look at that Evangelion mouse pad right there. That's gonna go so well with my gaming PC. Holy crap right there. So I'm gonna bring that home because my gaming PC and stream PC is at home. So I'm gonna bring it home, amazing. All right, back to the guitar cable. So the best guitar cable in the world, what? Cables are really weird, man, because you know, there's expensive cables and then there's cheap cables and there's a, sometimes a difference between them. Sometimes there's not a difference between them. And sometimes even an expensive cable can be shit. So like, it, I have such a weird experience with cables. I was actually sitting working on the shock pedal uh, a couple of months back and I was like, there's this noise I just can't get rid of. And I tried it in different, uh, you know, different setups. I thought it was like the power and shit like that. And uh, I was like, dude, there's something wrong with this unit until I switched my very expensive cable to another cable. And that was like the last thing I thought about. So that, what is this? Let's check it out. Salvation, breathe me, redeem your soul. <laughs> okay. No, okay, I'm ready for salvation. Oh shit, okay. All right, cable made in Taiwan. Let's go, let's check it out. It comes in this beautiful bag. Ooh. I mean, it does look sturdy, absolutely. New trick plugs right there. You know, one of these, uh, that things. So let me try, is it the best guitar cable in the world? Let's check it out. I suspect that this brand Salvation is what uh, what they're called. Um, it's, you know, it's it, they may just make premium cables. And there's so many other brands that make premium cables, man. All right, let me shut off the noise gate. Do I get more or less noise? So let me try my Diadario cable. I mean, to me, it's the exact same noise level, or is it? I mean, I could make it proper and just record the signal and see how I feel. What is the difference between this Salvation cable right here and this Cordial cable I got a couple weeks back? They're both braided cables. I mean, the Salvation cable is a little bit thicker. It has the same Nutrik plug right there as the Cordial cable. Uh, there's a lot of text here uh, explaining why this is the best guitar cable in the world and that it's, you know, it's made of silver-plated copper. 
Mid frequencies and high frequencies are gorgeous, but the high frequency will not break the sound due to the gorgeousness. Uh, but it does not mean that it has no low frequency. Please test it. The low frequency is comparable strength of ordinary cable and the feeling of diving into the heart. Uh, you know, this might be true. Absolutely. You know, I just can't hear it uh, immediately like this. I would need to sit down and do like a, a solid DI test. But compared to this Diadario cable that I have here, I didn't really hear uh, a difference at all. All right, so now I made a quick DI test using the cordial cable and the uh, salvation cable. And I just wanted to take a little look at the files right here. I mean, even listening through the DI right here, I don't really hear a difference in between the different cables. Not a difference that's worth mentioning of, at least. So, all right, so I talked a little bit with uh, a couple of members of mine after I did this, and I explained this thing about testing this salvation cable. And uh, one thing was raised that I didn't actually think about, and that is that it might really be a super good cable for like acoustic guitars. So maybe for acoustic guitars, you know, you would hear uh, uh, an increase in quality Quality. Also, I looked into the price and I noticed that on the website the price is freaking 500 euros or 500 US dollars for a cable. <laughs> so it's really expensive and that makes me a little bit scared because in a fast approach like this where I just hooked up the cable and compared to my other cables I didn't really hear a, a big difference in terms of feel like it was promised right here so I feel like I'm probably not the right guy to demo something like this I think you have to be an audiophile like a real audiophile to try something like this out and see if it is really the best guitar cable in the world but personally I wouldn't purchase a cable for 500 euros and for my application, it doesn't really matter that much, to be honest. Maybe it is the best guitar cable in the world. I'm not the right guy to tell. So there you go. Just a little honesty for you right there. 500 euros. Hiya. Holy shit. I think the difference is just too slight, you know. So there you go. Adventures with all. Ola's Tech Tips is returning. Remember the computer I built? Look at that beautiful thing. Since I uploaded that video, a lot of people have been saying, like, oh, Ola, you need to change the direction of your bottom fans. Oh, there's gonna be so much dust in there, man. That's what people are saying. So I figured, okay, I'm Ola England. I have to uh, fix it, I guess. So I'm gonna open up the case again and fix this, okay? So you guys can calm down a little bit because you guys, you have a lot of anger inside of you, you know? Calm the f down, okay? <laughs> also, another thing I'm gonna do is hook up another CPU cable to the power supply because obviously that was also a thing that someone complained about, so... Yes, okay. Uh. Uh. <laughs> Except that everyone's complaining that they should be upside down. Here's that port I need to hook up. Okay. Don't pay attention to the shitty uh, wiring. That's uh, not gonna be seen. I promise. No, you're not seeing shit. Shut up, Zach. Ugh. Oh my lord. All right, so now I have that. That's going in there. Uh... Moment of truth. Turning it on. Well, take a look at that. I don't understand this fan at the back that doesn't spin. What's its problem? 
fans are meant to spin. Now this one. Why isn't that one spinning? That's what I wonder. It is giving the RGB, you know, I'm getting the RGB effect out of it, which I like. But why is it not spinning? Oh, five, no, 5,600, I guess. Awesome, got the 5,600 uh, enabled here. Still gotta figure out the fans though. All right, let me see, there's a kit. Oh, maybe it's this. I Just so you know, I stuck in my uh, finger into a fan. <laughs> All right, so I connected uh, this uh, non-working fan to another port on the other port, and now it's working great. So uh, yeah. All right, another thing people complain about is that this graphics card isn't getting enough support. It's such a heavy graphics card that I will need to support it here just to lift it up a little bit so it's not you know angled into the slot. I have a little bit of this like plastic uh, pipe that I'm gonna cut. I make like a, a little stilt. Is that what you call it? A stilt for this. All right, cut and ready. Look at that. Fuck, I'm such a pro. The stilt is on and since it's PVC, you know, and uh, a little bit transparent, you know, the, the RGB is gonna look great. All right, there it is, look at that. I fixed it. Will people be happy now? I have these fans too. I have these fans blowing out air at the bottom. These pulling in right there. I'm not sure about that one, What about whatever. Also this little plastic pipe holding up the graphics card a little bit. The CPU processor cable is in, so I mean, I'm good now. But please, go ahead, go play some more so I can fix some more. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I really enjoy playing around with the computer like this. It's, it's a lot of fun. All right, you beautiful people. Thank you so much for tuning in to this uh, Sunday with Ola. This coming week, man, I will go to NAMM. So next Sunday with Ola will be recorded before NAMM, but it will be after NAM, which is a little bit weird, but you know, so the news from NAM will not be in the Swola, I guess. But I will make another video where I'm walking around NAM and be like, hey, check out this news. Maybe this new McThompson ESP or something. I don't know. There's gonna be a Swola, it's just not gonna be very up to date because a lot of things are happening this coming week. But, anyways, thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to support what I do, you can get uh, the Chug Project. You can pre order that. The album is out April 30th on all streaming platforms. We're also gonna start uh, shipping out the orders now. I think the vinyls are gonna come this week so we can start shipping everything out. And thank you so much to everyone who already pre-ordered the album. Thank you so much for the support. Also, tomorrow there will be a live stream on Old England Channel number two. We check out the Swala Rift Challengers. Okay, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Have a great Sunday Monday. Goodbye.